whole process. Yeah. yeah. I can hear you. <laughs> Surprise, it's Joseph. <laughs> We'll probably give it till 7.05, let people filter in. I almost have the notes set up, so I will drop those in the chat here. Well, students, it's your show. You guys can kick it off whenever you want. Okay, well, why don't we have um, each of us introduce ourselves. Um, hi, I'm Lexi. I'm from 2052 Nightcrawler. Uh, my name's Gabby. I'm from 2531 Robohawks. Um, I'm Ian. I'm from 3926 The Emperor's. I'm Phoebe, I'm from 2491 No Mythic, and I am a graduating senior, so I've been mostly, like, supporting and giving opinions, but mostly they'll be talking. Okay. So, um, did Paige? Yeah, I did. Uh, I'm Paige, I'm from 6045 Cyber Robotics. Awesome. Okay. I think that is all of us that are here already on the board tonight. Um, 
for any students who are interested in, you know, like joining onto this after, you know, learning about what we're kind of interested in tonight, um, let us know. We can connect you with that. Um, yeah, so let's start with um, kind of what our situation for starting the FUM Student Advocacy Board um, and just, you know, kind of like our mission um, behind this idea. Let's see, I think our first yeah. one is geographical diversity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one thing that we kind of noticed in a lot of like the leadership boards within Minnesota, like the Fume Board and um, a couple of others that we saw was that a lot of the geological diversity or geographical diversity um, is within uh, the metro area. And I think we only saw like one or two that weren't in the metro area when, you know, we have a state of like over 200 teams, I'm pretty sure. And, you know, the Metro does have a lot of teams, but there's a lot of teams that just aren't heard from in these meetings. And we think that a lot of students, you know, aren't given the opportunity. And uh, just because and like teams as a whole just aren't given the opportunity that they need uh, to advocate for themselves. And so that's one of the things is we wanted to give um, uh, geographical diversity just within Minnesota. We um, we're looking maybe at like the Minnesota State High School League, how they divide up all the teams and then we find one from like each of the sections. Um, and that's kind of what we've been following so far in regards to kind of getting students involved in the board. So that way we can uh, keep track of that. But then uh, we also wanted to give an opportunity for student advocacy because we feel like there isn't a lot of opportunities uh, for students to kind of advocate for like student interest while in a lot of organizations kind of similar to first like DECA or HOSA they have like a student board and so we kind of wanted to start one up with them first um, and kind of give students um, just an opportunity to be heard and to help with like student communication throughout the state and yeah uh, Ian, um, Paige do you guys have anything? Lexi <laughs> about anything you want to add? Is that I a good intro? I think you covered. I think you covered it pretty well. Um, I think the original idea for this board started um, as something that Gabby said on the uh, Minnesota North Star thread on Chief Delphi, um, and so we kind of were like, "That's actually a really cool idea," and then we kind of ran with that. Yeah, and I think. It's um, another one of our bullet points is, you know, student communication. Um, and, you know, something that I've noticed um, is it was really helpful for me to join um, the, like, Twin Cities teams captain discord. But, of course, you know, that only is for, like, Twin Cities teams. And so I think there's a lot of teams in Minnesota that have student leadership and have students with ideas but there's not a great framework for them to express that, um, especially, you know, when we look at teams that have less resources and, you know, if they want, they have outreach goals and things, working with other teams, you know, pooling those resources um, is a great way to do that. And so creating essentially a framework for communication is something that would benefit, you know, teams all around Minnesota because it would, it would just build those relationships um, and I think that's something that this kind of board and opportunity could easily do. Um, I know like mentors have hub meetings and stuff. And I think if students had the opportunity to have that, that could be really great. You know, that's something that we're kind of trying to do with this call. Um, but expanding it, I think is just a good idea. Yeah, I agree with that. Kind of just, this was kind of what we wanted the meeting is kind of get advice from like mentors and, you know, people that are kind of working up in like the leadership board and just kind of get some advice on like what we can do just to help out Minnesota first, because that's why we're here is to help bring up Minnesota first and also just like upper, um, the upper Midwest. So I think that's our kind of angles. It should just help everyone that we can. Um, but we are just students. So we do want some adult support too. So, yeah. Yeah, and the, and the other thing with adult support and mentor support is that, you know, as students, we're only in this program for, I mean, unless you come up through FLL, 
um, were only in FRC for four years, um, maybe maybe five if you joined as an eighth grader. But that's not a lot of time to get to know, you know, the more bureaucratic side of things. And so there are a lot of things that adults know that we can, you know, we might not know, but we could benefit from. And so that's, at least from my perspective, one of the reasons I really wanted to do this call tonight was just to, you know, get some feedback from people who are knowledgeable about, you know, the first upper Midwest system or how these things work to get some ideas and feedback on issues that we think are important and how we can address them. Yeah. Uh, Ian, do you want to maybe list off some of the um, kind of things we want to address and some of the ideas we have? Um, yeah. So when we were kind of talking about um, the, when we started this, like in general, the things we were looking for um, of you know, we kind of noticed there's like a bunch of different areas, but, you know, a lot boiled down to, you know, um, we wanted to be able to improve team experience, team competitiveness, competitiveness and the competition experience for teams, you know, and we can't, the more you break those down, um, it kind of gets into um, a lot of different, areas so we kind of talked about how you know one of the biggest things that helps teams is being able to be connected with other teams um and so um we what we really want to have is the ability for you know a better way because you know right now in minnesota it feels you know very disjointed for communicating with other teams like for example, I know that until, you know, probably last year, our team didn't have very many relationships with other teams. <clears throat> and we were kind of just, you know, trying, you know, to build a robot in the dark. Um, and um, and so one of our main priorities, right, is, you know, to hopefully figure out ways to increase that communication. Um, I'll let someone else talk about the next one. Um. Paige, do you want, or did Paige just leave? I think I might have just saw her. I think she might have gotten disconnected. Yeah, that's what I think. Um, I can talk about um, the next one is kind of just like the mentor, sponsors, and students aspect of it. And so right now, what we've kind of heard is just because like, you know, there's the threat of like the recession and everything. And like a lot of teams are losing their legacy support that maybe had started up their teams. And I feel like... Um, we just, a lot of teams are really struggling with finding more funding, more like mentor support, because like, even in like the metro area, well, they may have not, you know, they might have the mentor support or, you know, they might have the sponsorship, like they don't really have like all three, like, and so like one of the hardest things is like when teams are um, basically what we kind of found, like when we were kind of breaking it down is like when teams aren't thriving correctly, it breaks down into like mentors, sponsors and students. And so if you don't really have one of those, like if you have mentors and you have money, but you have no students, then how are you going to, like, you can still build the robot, but you aren't really helping bring up, you know, the students that, you know, first is supposed to be impacting. But if you have the mentors and the students, you might not have, you know, all the materials you need to build the robots. And so one of the things is that we want to help expand the resources so that way all teams in Minnesota have, you know, uh, they have mentor support or they have money and that can mean advocating at the state level, but it also can mean helping advocate for them at, you know, their county level or at their city level and helping maybe get a bit more funding just through like taxpayers money or advocating at their school board, but giving resources so that way teams can maybe advocate a bit more like in their area and making sure that, you know, they all kind of have the support they need. Um, and we have one other like kind of main point. Um, I'll pass it over to someone else. If someone else wants to take that. I can do competitiveness, but I also, I just wanted to add on to what you said about the mentor sponsors and students. I think something that a lot of teams run into, and this comes up in competitiveness as well, is even if, you know, you know, we're, we're looking to get more sponsors or we're looking to get more students. It is so hard to do that without a framework. And so having, you know, 
a student advocacy board that is a center where teams could go and say, okay, here are resources that we have prepared on, you know, ways to write sponsorship letters, or, you know, these are things to ask your school board for, stuff like that, because, you know, the it is hardest to come up with ideas like when you are in the middle of, you know, the crisis or the struggling. And so maybe one way that we improve the communication is also just like having resources available for teams. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. And that ties into, you know, one of the points we have with building up competitiveness, um, which we really see more as, you know, we have so many teams in Minnesota, um, but especially when we look at, you know, Metro based regionals, we have teams that it's week five, um, but they still are showing up to competition, um, you know, with maybe not a lot of code or major mechanical errors. And basically, give we those regionals tend to be less competitive because the teams that are attending them don't have the resources like to get their robots up to speed in the way that they would want them to be. Um, and so making those regionals more competitive is in turn giving those teams, you know, the ability to get more resources um, for themselves. And tied into that is the fact that I think what we've seen um, is about 60, 66% of teams in Minnesota only, only go to one regional. Um, and, you know, within the regional system, that means that, you know, we have a lot of Minnesota teams who won't go to champs just because they only go to one and, you know, it's very difficult to win. So part of, if we can increase mm, our regional competitiveness, that can allow teams to, you know, have a better competition experience and we can essentially let more and different Minnesota teams go to Worlds. Because I think something that we see a lot is a lot of the same legacy teams um, go to Worlds every year. And it is an important opportunity, you know, to allow those teams to go um, that maybe haven't gotten to as much. And also, you know, if they do qualify, kind of as we talked a little bit about last week, you know, qualifying is both a blessing and a curse because a lot of the teams, if they do qualify, now it's a question if they can even go because they don't have the resources to do that. So, you know, the competitiveness is kind of a whole lot of things, but the idea is, you know, getting more teams to the level where they can um, just really compete at a high level. Um, yeah. Yeah. And like, kind of just to go off of that is like building up competitive. That's kind of like our overwhelming goal, but kind of how we want to help is like within like our resources and stuff is like during some of the preseason regionals, uh, we want to create like a website or something and like a social media account. So that way we can have kind of all the resources on a website and then people could sign up for an email list. Because one thing we did notice within communication, and this was brought up in the chat was that it's very difficult with communication. And, and we were thinking if we can go to some of the preseason regionals and also if we have students from kind of all areas of Minnesota, they could all, they all have their own like preseason regionals and stuff they attend where we can maybe get some of this information out and then we could create our own, like newsletter because sometimes like the fume and like just their emails are so long and so hard for students to read. I know we have very short attention spans. And so if we can maybe, I don't know, like if some of you have seen like the daily brew, I'm pretty sure is what it's called, but just kind of helping simplify it down to like what students can read. So that way we can maybe start to get some of the students more involved because, you know, students can be a very big, you know, person within their team and like a big group because that's, you know, who's all, like working on it. And so uh, just like getting the students more involved, if we can give the students more resources, maybe their mentors can also help to become more involved and like making sure that, you know, the students also have a voice. Yeah. And like, even as a student who tries to read, you know, everything first related, I can like, you know, I sign up for like all the newsletters that I find and stuff. I think that like, even like halfway through the season, it was like, oh, you haven't been, because, like, there's the um newsletter, right, but then there's also the First Northland newsletter you have to be signed up for, um, but then also at the same time, you know, 
there's like the probably your regional hub or you know everything else that is you know sending out information and you know it feels like a lot of times the information gets just lost within the shuffle of everything and so having you know a streamlined way to do that um but you know part of that is also and this is something phoebe talked about a lot is we want to emphasize that we don't want to contribute to the problem in the way where it's like now there's just like, you know, an extra thing that is doing stuff in the region. And now you have to worry about, okay, so there's, uh, there's hubs, but then there's also uh fun, but then there's also FRC Northland. Um, and then there's the student advocacy board thing. Um, and you have like all of these different boards that are all, and that is definitely, you know, one area we want to avoid, um, which obviously is tricky um, from the perspective of you're trying to start a new thing without making more new things. Um. I think to speak to that, if I can, I also, my voice is dead. I just need to acknowledge it before I keep talking. But um, I, I think that that's part of why we're thinking about like, where can we hook in and where does it make sense for for a group like this to connect? I personally, like, I'll just speak for myself and not for the rest of the other people, but I think it would be nice to connect with FUM and have it actually be, a, um, you know, an official um, piece of the, the FUM leadership is actually having student leadership involved. So that way there could be some connection through there and and make it less of a you know separate item right it's like has recognizability and um but I also wanted to note that like th I was just you know um Gabby and Lexi and Ian were talking about all of these issues that they're interested in working on and I think that it's important to acknowledge that we know that there are a lot of adults out there already trying to work on these issues and uh, the goal of talking about them is not to be like, nobody knows about these things, but to be like, to, to demonstrate, I think that there is student interest and excitement and also working on these issues and trying to figure out how students can get involved in a meaningful way and actually um, contributing and bringing uh, our ideas to the table as well, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, we kind of summed it up in one line is that everyone is kind of looking at their own area and we aren't. And so we kind of disregard Minnesota as a whole. And so there may be people working on this, you know, on the other side of the state, but I'm not involved in any of those circles. So I don't I have no clue what's happening over there. And that's why we kind of want to kind of have that uh, geographical diversity is because there's such a disconnect where we don't understand or we don't uh, not understand, but we just don't know where all these resources are. And just so that information gap, you know, we're trying to help shorten that. Yeah. And, and yeah. I would say that there's also, I think a part of it of, um, you know, within that information gap, like, you know, if people who are on the call tonight right now, we have, you know, um, I guess on the current board, uh, cause pages from central Minnesota, we have, um, someone from 5232 Talons, um, who was unfortunately not able to make it. But, you know, besides that, the first people we were able to find um, were, you know, all the people in the metro area because we kind of already are networked together um, with Twin Cities team captains, where it was, you know, fairly easy, um, where it was like, you know, we have someone from the West Metro, you know, the East Metro, and then like kind of like the inner city um and so we kind of already had that to begin with but then like we were talking about like how do we connect with you know teams from like up north like you know i guess we went to the i went to the pits for fred at champs um they're like you know send us an email but like you know besides that it's you know i think a lot harder to you know create a network when there isn't one already there and your only networking events are uh, 48 hours of hecticness where everybody has more important things to be doing. Um, so in some ways there's like, you know, how can we find, you know, ways to increase communication other than, you know, the twice or three times a year 
meetups where we're actually all um, competing for something. And so, you know, not the top priority. And yeah. Okay. I have lots of thoughts, but I also don't want to take over the call. This is your call. Um, is there something specific? So I should probably give you a little bit of my background so that you might have more ideas on how I can help. Um, I am part of the Coaches Association. I'm on the board of directors. I am the treasurer, but I'm also the representative for Section 4, which is the mostly Northwest Metro. Um, and so I know all the other state section representative for the Coaches Association. I can um, get you in touch with any of those folks if you're looking for anyone from a, a kind of a specific area of the state. Um, so for sure you'll have a contact with at least one team because their team is in that section, but hopefully they'll be, they, they will hopefully have a way to connect you with more teams. Um, I'm also an organizer for our hub, which is called the Roseville hub. I recently took that over so I can speak to the hub experience and what mentors, why mentors participate, what they get out of it and how that all works. If you're interested in more hub related details, um, from a broader perspective, I've been an entrepreneur for about 15 years. I've talked to people about raising money for business. I've talked to people about raising money for the team. I have a little bit of insight into what it's like to try to get government money or money out of a school system. So I could talk to that a little bit too and share any advice on fundraising. I'm also the treasurer for 2052 Nightcrawler. Our annual budget usually falls somewhere between $75,000 and $95,000 a year. That's managed by the nonprofit, also mostly considered a booster club as far as the school is concerned. Um, so we that's how much money we manage to run the team. Um, our level of support with the school this year has been one paid coach and a school bus, two school buses to get us to events, three school buses, something like that. Um, we pay for all the trips, all the uniforms, all the robot parts. Basically anything that's not uh, our one pay coach or a bus to get us to a an event inside the state of Minnesota, the Booster Club pays for it. All right, with all of that said, uh, and I know there are similar people to that on the call mentor-wise. Um, I heard you say that you wanted advice from mentors. What can I, What? how can I help? Yeah, so I would be interested in how we can connect with the mentor groups, whether that's hubs or coaches associations, so that they can bring the opportunity of this board to their students. Is that something that is best done over email or we come to a meeting? Like how, what is the best way to connect on that? Um, someone brought up, how do you get connected with teams? And Jesse, uh, no, was it Jesse? Somebody posted in the chat, David posted in the chat. It's really hard to get connected with teams. And that's hundred percent true. So as the second section representative for section four, it took me about a year to get connected, uh, to get the contact information for about 80% of the teams in my section. So the coaches I represent, I still don't have connection contact information for some of those teams that I technically represent for the coaches association. There is an essential repository um, that we kind of have public access to. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, um, Nicole Shosau, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm saying that her name incorrectly. Um, Nicole just hosted a meeting with what I think was all of the hubs in the state of Minnesota on Thursday last week. And Nicole is a first, I, I believe she's a first paid employee to cover the Midwest. Um, okay, so you, Phoebe knows. Um, and so Nicole, one of the things Nicole is trying really hard to do is to um, reinforce or solidify the hub network so that every team feels like they sort of have a hub that they can participate with. And currently there's a gap in Southwest Minnesota, which I don't believe has a hub coverage. But most of the rest of the state has a coalition. They have a, a hub. They have a different different ones. Different places use different words, but um, that similar type of concept. 
Um, the way that I established my mailing list is I printed up QR codes and I went to every pit at every event that we were in, except for state, because I, I pretty much had everybody covered at that point, at least in my section for state. But I did that at um, Northern Lights. Or I'm sorry. Yeah, Northern Lights. And I think I actually hit the Lake Superior pits as well. And then also at 10K and I gave them a QR code. I gave my pitch and I said, please scan this QR code and give me your have all your coaches give me their contact info if you're interested in participating. I had a little Google form. And what's interesting about that, and I haven't checked this since 10K, um, but I was able to get a, an average of two to three coaches per team. And I think I got about 80% coverage. And in the questions I asked, I said, would you be interested in doing events with other teams in section four? And would you be willing to share your contact information with other section four coaches? All but one of the people that responded said yes to both questions. So there is an interest of coaches getting in contact with other coaches and being willing to share. So I think that's super encouraging. And I expect that probably is across the state. The trick is just getting that initial contact. I will say that Nicole shared with us that if you're trying to get in touch with a specific team to contact Nicole, she would reach out to the contact and show she has for that team through the first registration website. So all mentors have to go up. Well, not all mentors, but at least one or two or three representatives for all teams have to go into the first system and register themselves. Just like you guys all have to register yourselves as students. She might be the only person in Minnesota who has access to that list. She said she would reach out to them saying so-and-so from such and such a team is trying to get in hold with, get in contact with you is it okay if I forward their information? It's not a great system. They're working on trying to build something into the website where you can say, sort of like, a, have you ever been to a, a website where they say contact us form and you fill out the online web form, but you have no idea where that email is going? She's looking at trying to create a similar system to that. She's talking to the people who run their website to say, can we create the system to say, I want to contact Nightcrawler Here's the message I want sent to them. And then behind the scenes, it sends an, a sort of assistant email off um, with that information. So she's trying to create, make an easier way to uh, hide the contact information from a privacy point of view, but to give you the ability to get in touch with those teams. And in the meantime, she's willing to be the go-between person to do that. So that would be my best advice in terms of how do you get in touch with other teams is that you got to do the legwork like I did to get in touch with my section four coaches or um, to contact Nicole and see how she can help you. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, yeah. Maybe on our end, we can talk about with, you know, our different section representatives and kind of working through that. Um do you have, so you have a Discord that is set up for captains, right? Do you have yeah, a Discord? Twin Cities. Do you just have a Discord for like all Minnesota First students that they can join? I, oh. <laughs> yeah, you go, baby. You go. Or, okay, I, I was, well, I was going to say, I don't, I think that there may be something like that that exists. Um, the server that I have set up that's been mentioned several times is specifically for team captains in the Twin Cities metro area um i but i feel like ian if anybody would know it would be you i do know um yeah. so i'm in three minnesota student discord servers uh, about one pops up per year and they all die within a month or two of creation um that about right that's 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 the status we're at right now um, so why why do they die why do you think that they die um, so the first one I joined when it was already dead. I don't know how I got the invite link to that one. Um, the second one, um, a lot of it was given out at North Star Regional in 2022. Um, and people just stopped really talking in it. Um, like there just hasn't been too much activity in in the latest one, which I think is being helped run by the Minute Bots, um, which I got the link to at State this year, I mean, it's still alive, and I mean, it looks to be more active than the others, but seems like there's definitely, in some ways, 
people just aren't really, you know, there's not much constructive that happens in the servers. Um, and, you know, for the most part, it's just people figuring out, like, versus Twin Cities Team Captains, which has, you know, all of one channel. So everything that happens, constructive or not, right, is, is going into that channel. So, you know, for the most part, people are going to be keeping on topic because, you know, you want to keep the server, you know, you know, doing server gets purpose, but because it's, you know, a purpose driven server server, I think is what makes it successful versus a server that kind of has no aim, right. Where it just exists for existence's sake. And, you know, sometimes something of value will pop up in there, but at the same time, you know, a lot of it's going to be, you know, people having fun joking around which you know there's nothing wrong with that being in a discord server right That's so okay so let me put my entrepreneur hat on and so i've been through tons of pitches with investors and the first question i have is what is the problem you're trying to solve so if the if your discord server your product is not capturing customers and keeping them around which in your case is just audience um you're not solving a problem that they care about the other side of it is because I'm a game developer and my business is actually mobile gaming is that I'm not actually trying to solve a problem. I'm only creating problems by distracting people from something productive, right? So if you're not trying to solve a problem, then how are you keeping people entertained or interested? So a Discord server, we use primarily Slack at Nightcrawler, but I'm part of Discord servers for my game. And... I see what happens in there. And there's two things that happens in there. There's people that complain about things and other people are trying to talk them off a cliff um, and, and pull them back to reality and say, okay, it's not that bad or here's how you can solve your problem. So it's, it's, it is sort of problem solving. There are parts of that Discord pe server where people are like, what if we did this, right? And people are workshopping ideas and, and trying to get me to do things with my game to, do, to, to make it more entertaining for them. And then there's just channels where people are making jokes and, and, and jibes at each other and stuff like that. That's my experience with um, Slack. And that's my experience with Discord too, is that those servers survive because you either solve problems or you keep people entertained. And so if you want to run a successful Discord server, I think you have to keep those two things in mind. And unfortunately, it may be up to the leadership to sort of prime the pump on that every single week to make sure that it stays active. It's kind of a, a, a crappy thing and it requires a ton of dedication, but until it lives organically, the leadership has to be the one that, that keeps it alive. Yes. Um, I, I have a funny little side story, but I was at an entrepreneur conference one time and on stage, they invited the founders of Reddit to come in and talk about how they started Reddit. And it turns out that the first 200-ish accounts on Reddit were 100% fake. The two founders spent all day, every day, for months, pretending to be 200 different accounts and having conversations with themselves about, oh, I found this thing, this is really cool, or you're not going to believe what this person said, and creating all these accounts to create these conversations. And then suddenly, over time they had to do less and less of that because there was actual accounts having actual discussions that kept all that stuff alive. It sort of underscores the necessity of if you want to start a community, you, you can't just say, okay, we're a community, but you have to sort of by sheer will force that to be able to take root so that everybody will stick around and say, oh, this is kind of interesting. I'm, I'm going to check in on, on this tomorrow or I'm going to check in a, on it you know, every day or every week. Um, I like the idea of creating a student group. I really wish students would do a better job of working, to having friendships and relationships and communicating with other teams. I love it when our students come to, to meetings and say, hey, you know what's, what so-and-so team is doing? They're doing this crazy thing. It's so awesome. They're going to build a robot that jumps over the charge station. You know, um, I, think that's, I think that's awesome. I love that. Um, but it doesn't just happen. You guys, uh, if you want that to happen, I, my best advice is you, you got to brute force that conversation around purpose or around entertainment. Yeah, I really agree with that. And I think part of the reason that mm -hmm. the Twin Cities one works is everybody who is there knows that if they have a problem or a question, like 
they ask it and immediately people will come up with responses and answer. And so it's not like sending an email into a void and just being like, I don't know, like, you know, you're going to get that response. So I totally agree. Uh, no, I've mentioned the discord and I did that on purpose. I, my experience with email isn't great for students, but it's also not a great for adults, right? Everybody's sort of moved on to real time communications. I'll be honest. I check my business email once every two days, maybe every three days. I know there are other people that are everything, every time their computer beeps, they go check their email. Uh, I'm not one of those people anymore. But if I get a Slack message, I'll see that Slack message probably within two hours. Um, so I think the way people communicate has changed and uh, creating an, a mailing list, a, a newsletter. <sighs> There's definitely reasons to have a newsletter. Um, you know, we do this call on a weekly basis and you all got, you, you all show up because I send out a, a, a weekly update of, Hey, we're going to do this call. I read all the weekly newsletters that Nicole sends out. Um, but a lot of times I'll miss it or I'll skip it. I'll be like, I don't have time for this. And by the time I do come back to it, it's already a week late and all the information's out of date. Um, so you have to, you have probably will have to do multiple different ways of communicating. But unfortunately, all those different ways take time and they take a different sort of strategy and approach to building it successfully. Yeah, I mean, oh, you can go, Phoebe. You can go. Okay. Well, I will just say with running the different weekly update for Nightcrawler, yes, absolutely. One way is not enough. Um, but if you have the right structure and the right process, you know, in terms of my case, I write the weekly update. And what I send out on email, on Slack, and on the website is the, and what I read on the podcast is the exact same. Like, I'm not, I, I refuse to rewrite anything um, because I already spend, you know, an hour, hour and a half doing it. So I think, um, yeah, and I think also different communication methods can be used for different things, right? Like, you know, if you want a problem answered, yes, that is real time communication, absolutely. But if we're saying, here's our resource of the week, right? Or, you know, like, here's the next, like, month of, a, you know, this is when a week zero event's happening. This is when, you know, a preseason competition. Like, if it's just once a month, an email goes out and it has your entire month calendar, I think something like that that's more static is, is fine in that scenario. Um, and then, you know, websites are more archival, right? If we're creating resources that are like, here's how you write a sponsorship letter, you know, here's different, you know, this is a page where a bunch of different teams have contributed, you know, their Lego camp ideas or how they recruit new students, right? Something that just stays, you know, I think that's also fine. I think it, it's knowing, you know, who your audience is for that and what the purpose is and not expecting everything to work the same. Yeah, I would agree with that. I do the team communication for my team too. And like, we have a team discord, we use a team, e we have like an email, we have, you know, we have subgroups that use Slack, we have subgroups that, you you know, use Remind, like, you all kind of like, and then it all kind of gets collaborated together. And like, we tried this year to kind of get it all towards email, just because that's what our mentors really wanted. And we told all our students that, hey, you're going to be happy to check your email. And so setting that expectation in advance, I think helped. But like in a situation like these, you know, like we'll spend an hour like formatting something, but then you send that out everywhere. And that's kind of how you try and get the biggest, you know, group of people is just by sending it out and having, figuring out what works best for people. I also think there's a question of like, D the different levels of just because you were talking about the discord server and it was i was going back to thinking about um the idea of having a smaller group of like students involved in leadership like a committee that's just, like how many sections are there in minnesota i don't know like i think there's seven eight i can look it up i think there's seven, seven right okay. if you're seven or eight, approximately that seven. many students involved in like a leadership committee or something um who then are going back and communicating to people in their um section um and a, a group like that is like a smaller group and then the people you're trying to reach is a 
larger group of people. I don't know if I'm making sense. I just don't necessarily want to conflate the two things. Like, I think that the interest that I'm hearing is in creating a smaller group involved in leadership that's then trying to communicate to a larger group of people. Yeah, and I, I could see something where, you know, you join a Minnesota Discord, but what your most of your communication happens in your section channel, right? In the same way that, just because, like, trying to imagine a 200 team, I think it's just going to be chaos. Um, and also, like, we can increase communication with people from around the state, but, you know, realistically, you know, a team from all the way up north is not going to, like, be at a school, you know, from South Minnesota, like, helping them. It's, it's, it's much harder to do that. So I think facilitating those close connections and then having an opportunity for, like, larger discussion. But, yeah, I think there's, like you said, levels of groups and, like, making that small group um, connection is important. I yeah, found the list. I there are, sorry, there are eight sections on the list. If anybody wants to know what section they're in, just give me your number and I'll and I'll fix it. I'll find it out. Yeah, like one thing I think why the Minnesota FR, FRC servers kind of don't really work well is because they don't really have a like their purpose is you know to help you know ha have students have like a spot to like talk to other robotics kids, but there's not really a main purpose. And like I feel like what I see is just like there's one kid that's like oh, I want to create, like, a Minnesota server, you know, but there's not really, like, a, like, purpose, or there's not really a reason, and then, you know, there's a couple, like, their friends will join it, but it won't really be, or, like, they'll send it out at, like, competitions, but there's not really a purpose, there's not really a reason, and I feel like the Twin Cities Discord channel, like, what's, uh, like, the captain's one, it's really helpful because, like, you can ask, like, a problem or something, and, like, you'll have someone respond right away, but there's also, like, kind of a level of like jokiness and seriousness that I feel like, you know, we don't really have kids that I feel like, I mean, you kind of talked about this, like on your um, game server, um, how like there's people like, you know, might be on the brink of like, you know, different situations. And so I feel like there's just a different level, like we're all talking about like robotics issues. And like, I feel like that also helps just like with the server and keeping it like kind of a bit more like, serious if that makes sense and I think that really helps to keep people involved because if there's just a bunch of people you know that you know might be saying like depressing things like people aren't really going to want to be there and talking about stuff and so I feel like that's something that the Twin Cities like captain server is really good at you know like there's like there's just a level of like I, I don't want to say like maturity but like we're all like the leadership like representatives for our teams and so I feel like just that level like we all have like exper shared experiences. And I think that helps too. Well, Gabriella, is, is, do you go back? Oh, Gabby, I'm on my Gabby? school account okay. right now. Yeah. All right. So Gabby, I think you bring up a really good point. And there's something to be said about being exclusive as well. People want to go. There's this saying in, in when you price a product in business, there's always the next velvet rope. Like what, what, do, what, do, what do I get with this kind of money? What could I get with this kind of money? And, and businesses kind of always want the top tier support and, and, and features and stuff like that. The enterprise plans on the internet never list a price because you, you get that sense of exclusiveness. It might be a good idea for you guys to set up a discord or chat room or whatever you do and call it the Minnesota FRC leadership discord and you might have some students kind of quote unquote sneak in there because they want to be part of the cool kids club, but they're also going to probably want to contribute to show that they're a leader. And then just by, just by the way you phrase your audience of, Hey, if you're in here, you're part of this group of wanting to be a leader that might, it might accomplish your exact goals that you're saying here is that we want the kind of students who want to be part of, of making things better. And maybe just naming it a certain way might filter out the people of, oh yeah, I'm just here to screw around. I don't, I don't want to be part of these conversations. And they may self opt out. Um, I'm not saying that you should have to like present your driver's license and show us on your website that you're a captain on the team or a sub team leader or something. I'm more or less just saying maybe just very clearly state here are the objectives of being part of this. Here's what our expectations are for helping other teams or, or asking for advice. 
And that might be all you need to do to, to kind of create the tone, create the culture of what you're trying to accomplish. Absolutely. Um, one thing that we might be able to do is almost like make it a leadership thing, but then also make like subgroups of, okay, here's the Midwest chat. Here's the like Northwest chat, like make it different subgroups so that like everyone can talk to their own hub but then also have a chat where it's just general and make it so that everyone can also add their opinion to whatever's happening yeah that could actually be interesting because the way twin cities team captains is run right now and phoebe could probably expand more on this than i could um uh, but I, I talked to Phoebe a lot about, like, the future. The Twin Cities team captains was getting handed off and, you know, all that stuff. But it would be interesting to see, you know, if that model is, you know, done for other, you know, regions. Like, you know, obviously there's the Twin Cities team captains, but there's no reason there can't be, you know, Central Minnesota team captains in the same way. And be interesting to see, you know, if... That was up, but then there's also you know a collective meeting place for all the captains across the state that might not necessarily be about you know getting help on how do I captain better, which you know we wanted to keep it you know, fairly small because we didn't want to be like you know super busy with other questions getting buried before questions got answered and we're already hitting that capacity number, anyways. But it would be interesting if there was like a collective one that was, you know, specifically about improving Minnesota, the things that are relevant to all of Minnesota. Can can I shift what we're talking about a little bit, or would you like to? I, this is a question for Lexi and Gabby and Ian and Paige. Is that okay? Yeah. Um. Yes. Okay. I'm curious for advice on. The idea of, um, like, the more general question of what, how can students um, hook in to leadership and what, in, in the problems and the issues that Lexi and Gabby and Ian especially were talking about, where do you see a place for students to take part in finding solutions? Uh, I like your. I like what you said about having student involvement in FUM. I think that's something you should definitely approach the FUM leadership on and say we'd like to be part of the solution and be part of those discussions. Um, I, I'm, Lexi has probably shared with you that captains and mentors have a weekly meeting in Nightcrawler and decisions get made about how the team does um, things with both student and mentor input. Um, for all the events we do, all the things you buy, all the scheduling we do, it happens with captains and mentors. And, you know, asking to if you can be part of that conversation with higher level organizations, I think is a, a question worth asking. They might say no because of this or because of that. I mean, I, I don't know what those reasons would be. And they very well could have legitimate reasons not to. But I also don't know why they wouldn't want some of that input. Um, so I think you should um, approach the FUM board. You, you, I, I'm confident you guys know how to get in touch with FUM. Um, one of the Nightcrawler mentors is on FUM, so Lexi certainly has a contact point there as well. And I, I think that's a, appropriate. Um, are, there, are there specific issues that you want advice on? That I mean, I, I don't know what advice I could give, um, but if there's, are there specific issues in terms of hooking into mentor groups or anything like that? I don't I don't know that there's issues. Well, Ian, maybe you have an answer. Go for it. Um, I was going to say it'd be interesting to see where the other um, adults in this call would be, you know, thinking about what the most pressing things they would like, you know, a student advocacy board in specific to address. Maybe we should start with this. Um, are you curious to know what the hum, what what hub mentors talk about when they meet? So the Roseville Hub meets every Saturday morning for breakfast before we all go to our Saturday meetings. 
we talk about where am I going to find these parts? They're sold out. They've been sold out for weeks. Does anybody have a gearbox we can borrow? Does anybody have compliant wheels we can borrow? Um, there's a lot of bartering for parts that happens at the Saturday breakfast. Um, occasionally, a mentor will bring up saying, I have a problem with one of my students or one of my captains. Um, how do I mitigate this issue? Do you have suggestions for how we resolve this conflict or, or um, things like that? And they'll, they'll be asking. I, I've actually been at, um, my advice has been seek, sought several times um, because I'm a programming captain or one of the things I do is I've got this lead programmer who refuses to work with any other students on the team or won't help with training or blah, 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 things like that. Um, and do you have any advice on how I can get this person to work with the other students or train, you know, participate in training or stuff like that? That's a very common thing that mentors seek from one another is how do I help my students be better captains or better leaders? Um, and we have that type of advice. We occasionally will talk about robots being built. Um, some people are more open than others. Some people don't like to share their secret sauce until they have something that's functionally working. And I think you guys probably all get that. Um, and then others will ask, you know, how are you going to avoid tipping over or what type of drivetrain you're going to use or, um, you know, things like that. Have you ever considered this? Have you ever considered that? And we just kind of share advice in those ways. We don't really talk about funding. I mean, we've had some fundraising talk and people have said, hey, do you, do you mind if our team does fundraising like that and contacts that person? There's been some of that. But for the most part, it's just a place for mentors to get together and talk about other mentors and just kind of feel like, okay, I guess I'm not doing such a bad job after all type thing and get that reassurance from other mentors that you're doing okay. I have a feeling that your captain's group is probably that support network as well, right? So it's not really all that different. No major decisions are made in hub meetings at all. I mean, I can't think of one single thing in a hub that happened in a hub meeting that uh, impacted any teams. Um, it's just kind of more of a social support network, honestly. Uh, Jesse, do you have a different experience with your group up up in the Arrowhead? Or no, you're in uh, well, Central. North Central. Yeah, Central you're in Central. Central. But yeah, our hub meetings are a lot more probably business e oriented uh we're a 501c3 and um we're talking about our nmrc championship where the money's going to come from um where teams can stay how we're going to get that funded we're talking about our programming camp that we collaborate with our local university on and that kind of stuff and who's going to volunteer and who's going to run that um but it's cool i mean i know it's tough for for you younger folks on the call here I mean, you guys are the exceptional group of Minnesota because you guys are the ones that are obviously involved, right? Because you're, you're doing these things already. Um, and I wish I had more people on my team that were involved with folks like you. Uh, but one thing I was thinking, I mean, we have, and Scott knows, we have our, our Slack channel that we're on. And just, I mean, we have a, a group that's about the state tournament. We have some random stuff. We have our Improving Minnesota First and General and a couple other things that people jump in and out of, but maybe <clears throat> this is just a suggestion, but maybe, you know, I've, I got a couple young uh, impact award uh, ladies that, you know, could use some guidance from people that have experience with that. And I can't give them that. And I can't give them a student perspective on that. And I would be very happy to share some information with them on our discord or our Slack. If you guys have something created and I, think they might be interested in being involved in that uh, but just maybe having one of those things and dividing it up into different uh, subsections of the team and then you can have because a lot of teams have their leaders of x y and z and maybe trying to get some kids involved and I have contact information for all 31 teams in my in my hub and I would happily send that to all the lead mentors of all of them and you might get 5% student response on that kind of thing, you know, but you might get five or six new kids that are, are willing to step up and, and be part of your group. Uh, 
Uh, for us at Talon, we kind of have something similar. <clears throat> we have a thing called Southwest Hub, which is more so for like the students. And we try to set up meetings every like month or so, probably every other month or so, where a team will host an event and teams will just come over and connect. And they do just like fun games. Like I think one time it was dodgeball and a gymnasium. It was more just for like networking purposes. Not too much business, but it's always been fun, and it kind of gets us to connect. And we do it through a Slack server. I like that. I, yeah, I think the idea. I feel like this can serve both the the social and the the resource purposes from the standpoint of you know maybe you you have your your section channel that. Um, leaders are a part of and that's the more like social connection and like asking questions but you know I, I like Jesse's idea of you know hey I'm a build captain I have you know an issue with you know how we're doing how we you know how do we how can we improve our prototyping process or you know what are ways to reach out to local companies and get them to you know machine things for us um and so that I that idea of like specialization in that way, um, it's almost like you know a different form of exclusivity because it's specific to your sub team or your interest or your project. So yes, yeah, I I, I like that a lot. Uh, I had a thought. If you're looking for sort of a foot in the door for First Upper Midwest or with First in general. Um, I can tell you that I know that one of the hardest thing that FIRST is dealing with, and um, there's been a lot of talk on the socials this year about Minnesota should go to districts or we need to have more smaller regionals, and, and there's been a lot of that conversation. I will tell you that I believe the biggest amount of pushback that I've heard on that is that we barely can get enough volunteers to run their re the events we do how are we going to support districts or how are we going to support regionals and then the money that goes with it? Now you guys might not be able to help a whole lot with finding the money that goes with it, but most of our volunteers are parents. Mm -hmm. And so going and saying, how can we help get more volunteers? How can we help get the word out to our families of student families to say, look, you don't have to just send your kid off to a meeting. You can actually go and, and participate as a referee or as someone who directs traffic to load and unload robots um, or just directs traffic in the hallway to stop kids from getting run over by a robot. Um, there's lots of different volunteer roles that can be done and not all of them require you to wear a striped shirt or a blue shirt or a yellow hat. Um, if you guys were interested in making a big impact, I feel fairly confident that if you said we want to create um, a stronger volunteer supply, that would probably go over very well. Maybe not. Um, I don't know. Um, but I can tell you that if that's one of the things that you guys were thinking about in terms of your competitions, that we need more competitions, smaller competitions, something like that, um, the volunteer is a, is a big concern that I've heard people bring up of getting enough people to be, to volunteer. Um, so that would be one piece of feedback I, you may not be aware of. Um, it sounds like Ian is aware of that. Maybe you guys have already talked about that. Um, but I think it's a big roadblock to having more events uh, personally. Yeah, that's kind of how like we came up with the entire idea is we were on the like chief Delphi thread and I was like, oh, I didn't realize students could do more than being like the safety glasses handout. Like, and that's kind of how we started coming up with like, students have no idea that there's all these opportunities. Like I, I'm on a team of like 45 students. I'm a team captain. Half those kids are sitting in the stands or they might be at their hotel. And I'm like, I could sincerely just be sending them off to go do volunteering, like at the competition. Like there's so many kids that kind of just sit around and do nothing besides like scouting. Mm -hmm. And like, I have them all in rotations, but they still get bored during the regionals or they just, they're like, Oh, I'm only here to scout. And like, I feel like giving them more opportunities to get involved would also be helpful. And like, I had no clue that we could do more with that. And that's kind of the main reason. Yeah. 
And I don't know if there's an 18 plus rule on some of those things, but like field reset crew, I mean, go do field reset at an off season event or something like that. Or, or um, I, I know that we've had students before that did field reset uh, at different competitions. Um, I, I don't know if there's a rule that you have to be on a, you can't be on a team that's competing or you have to be a certain age, but those are all great questions to ask. Um, and I know that like something is like at the test last year, is it called mini trials or yeah, you know, whatever it's called now. Um, uh, but like they had, you know, this thing where, cause they didn't have volunteers. Like if your students in the stands, right. And you're bored, we need field reset people. We, and so, I think it was, you know, students scoring, students doing field reset every match, you know. I was scoring. It was really fun. And so, like, it was, you know, almost all student run. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't that hard to, you know, do. And, like, you know, I think almost every team had people volunteering at some point in the day. And, you know, from a student perspective, you know, Obviously, some of the more subjective things. I'm not sure. For official events, do you have to be like over 18 to be on field reset? Jesse just posted in the message that there is an age limit. So I think it's. I, I still think it might depend on the role, though. Because yeah. it let me apply for field reset at 10K Lakes because I didn't have school those days. Mm -hmm. um, so I applied to be on field reset. Um, because that was like the one that I was allowed to check off, but then um, they were overbooked with volunteers anyways because it was the only Minneapolis. But again, I think these are great conversations to have. Maybe there's maybe there's a way that um, students can help, you know, remove some of that burden. You know, the challenge is, and and maybe this isn't fair, but the challenge is, is okay, we have three people signed up, but are they going to show up? You know, and students. I will say a lot of them don't have their own transportation, right? So reliability could possibly be a limiting factor there. But again, I think these are conversations worth having. If you start out with how can I help, you know, maybe the answer is going to be, I'm sorry, there just isn't a way because if you're participating in the program, you can't be a judge. Well, that makes sense, right? I mean, that's just kind of the way it works. But there might be other places where there is something you can do. Yeah, and I think one, the other one other thing area that I I would like to see some students step into, and this is a role I don't think students have ever even been asked to step into, is to be on the regional planning committees. I mean these these events are planned for students. There are no students on the regional planning committees, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know. Um, so they're planning these events for you but you don't have much say in what happens at them. Like what kind of workshops are presented, what kind of things are happening during them. You know, what what's important to you that happens at these events? It's, you know, all these old people that are planning them for you. So I, I would like to see some of your voices be represented on those regional and state planning committees. Yeah, and so I know, like, for example, there's a committee going on right now for FUM turning itself into a PDO that was, like, going around at State, um, and I took a photo, and so they were looking for, I think, one student on the board, because um, I was talking to, um, he was there in the conversation, where I was like, because I think there should be more than one student on the board, because, you know, I'm assuming, I know that Gabby has also already applied for that position, I've applied for that position, I'm assuming there's other people who are students in, you know, just our Discord server of six leaders who are very interested in the logistics of becoming a PDO who would want to apply. Um, where, I mean, there isn't... Because the thing about students on the RPC is there's nothing that says that it has to be only... Because, like, I was looking at the application page because there's just, like, a link to applications. Um, but... I think it's like kind of general consensus, but uh, this is kind of a related side. I don't know, but a tangent on, you know, I guess leadership of the student board, um, you know, like a lot of the things, 
actually, this is a, probably a tangent to be put a hold on. That's that's my opinion of where the tangent is going. Again, I think it's appropriate to ask if you ask in a plight and a positive manner of we want to help. How can we help? You know, I think it's an appropriate thing to do. I think there are people who don't use a very GP attitude towards we need to change that, you know, create friction and that creates problems and it creates roadblocks. But if you're approaching it from the right way, I think it's a valid question to ask of we want to, we want to be a positive influence in there. How can we help? I, I don't know. I don't know how that all works. I, I don't know. I don't have good advice other than be, be GP, be positive and just ask. Yeah. And, you know, in terms of the volunteer thing, you know, if we're connecting people around the state, I think first alumni, you know, this is something that I've talked about in terms of our, you know, our own team on Nightcrawler. And like, I feel like there are a lot of alumni that we just don't reach out to and who would be involved in that way, mm -hmm. you know? And I think, th I think there are a lot of people who leave the program and, you know, maybe they're not at a place where they can be a mentor yet, but they still want to be involved and, you know, opening, opening that up or continuing to push that message. I think actually you may have hit on something very important here is that, getting alumni to go be robot inspectors and to be CSAs and to be on these roles that you kind of have to be out of the program and you have to be an adult to do. It's a great way to keep those people connected. It's a great way to get them back into a mentor role in the future. Um, you know, I'd love to see if you guys are thinking about setting up a discord server, I'd love to see you set up an alumni channel and, um, because they'll they'll network for helping each other find jobs and stuff too. I mean, there's a ton of value that you may be able to add um, by creating this network that goes beyond just the competition experience. Um, I think another thing in that area of how to get alums into those volunteer roles, um, and this is basically just going on a total tangent now, but looking at how to create interest in that for students while they're still in the program because like if there could be I don't know what the right avenue for this would be you know giving some sort of like workshop or letting students shadow or doing stuff at off-season events or I don't know what it is but I think that there's um a lot of like there's the separation between like here's what the students are doing at events and here's what the you know volunteers are doing at events the adults and like you said you know there's that age restriction you can't necessarily have a student be doing judging or doing FTAing or whatever um as a student but it, figure out if there's something you can do you know for the high school seniors to give them a chance to see how they could be engaged the following year um even in just small ways that provide an explicit invitation to come back and a chance to see what that might look like so that it's not a, a black box of how somebody would get into volunteering once they're old enough to do so. Yeah, an idea we kind of had during our first meeting is so like one of our big ideas, like when we first got in, we were like, we need like a lot more support leading up to it is having like a completely like student run preseason regional or something. And then we kind of scaled it down to maybe during the preseason regionals when there isn't as much as a like competitiveness, like you know, some team isn't going to go to Worlds based off of how well they do at the preseason events is maybe letting, you know, like the seniors or like the students get involved while they're still in high school. So that way they can gain experience, like build confidence within those roles. And that way they're like, oh, you know, when they're in college, they're like, oh, you know, I had a lot of fun volunteering at this preseason event, like back when I was still in high school and already creating those connections back when they're still in the program when, you know, there's not because like regionals were like, oh, yeah, you know, like those are pretty serious. Like we might not be able to get them in. But if we could have like a preseason regional where, you know, we're trying to actively recruit kids to be volunteers while they're still in the program before they've already left. And, you know, we might not have contact with them anymore is, you know, getting those connections while they're still in high school. Since there isn't right. a lot of that. Even like instead of, you know, you have like an FDA who is usually FDAing with first and then you have a student who's like shadowing them and learning from them throughout the off-season event or something like that. What if you guys set up 
um, learn to be a student robot inspector. And you had student robot inspectors for week zeros and for the preseason events or CSAs who I can't get, I can't talk to the radio. What's going on with the radio? And you go get a tech who can come over and help you figure out why your IP address is wrong on your radio. Um, Maybe there's an opportunity there to do something cool because, hey, if you're a senior and you learn how to be a robot inspector for a week zero, you're like, wait a minute, I did this last year. I could do this at 10K or I could do this at Lake Superior or at Great Northern. Um, you know, I'm going to school in Fargo. I should go over, I should drive down to Great Northern and be a robot inspector for the weekend. If you've already done it once now, it doesn't seem quite so scary to say, yeah, I'll sign up and I'll take the official training to do that, be a volunteer. I, th I think these are great ideas. I think I think there's a ton of potential in our alumni network that we don't tap. Um, we one of the things that we've been talking about for Nightcrawlers should we bring our alumni back for summer meetings? Maybe that's a way to reconnect. We it, this year and last year we have four five, four or five individuals who came back to be mentors five and six years after they graduated. It's been fantastic. It's been amazing. Um, we're trying to figure out how do we do more of that? How do we, how do we continue this pipeline of people that they get done with college, they get a job, they've got some free time, they don't have any kids yet, they're not married yet, they can come be a robotics mentor for a while and maybe for a long while. Um, but if you, don't, if you don't cultivate that pipeline of people, they sort of leave and go away and you never see them again. What other, how else can I offer advice with, I mean, you guys listed a ton of things at the start of this call. I'm happy to give whatever advice I can. Um, you said we want mentor this, feedback on this or support on this. What else can can those of us who are on the call here provide? Uh, I have a question kind of relating to students going to more coach-based meetings of how to avoid the almost like oh, it's a kid, like, the not being taken seriously, because that happens quite often, and it often probably happens because of how we present ourselves. Is there maybe a suggestion you might have of a way to avoid that? It's hard, um, and it's not just because you're kids. Um, when you get into the business world, you'll experience the exact same thing. Um, you'll be in a job for one or two years and you'll be up against somebody who's been there for 15 years and thinks your question is silly because you just haven't been there long enough to know the difference. Um, I'll admit when I got my master's degree in business, um, I was doing an evening program where you had to have had a job for at least two years before you can even apply to get an evening MBA. And we had one class where they let um, daytime MBA students. So, so those are students who went directly from undergrad right into the master's program, and this young lady asked, "I don't understand. If there, if things aren't working well in your job, why can't you just tell your boss that it's not the right way to do things?" And those of us who had had a, had you know been through the bloody noses of dealing with management and stuff, we all just started to chuckle. Um, and she very innocently didn't understand what was the joke. And it's just because she didn't have that experience to know that the politics of the workplace. Um, will always sort of dictate how you behave. So this is not a, a problem that's new to you. It has not much to do with the fact that you're a student. Um, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't, th this is a challenge you'll probably have for the rest of your life. So how do you deal with that? Um, I think one way to deal with that is to ask good questions or, or questions that you think are, are relevant and try to gather the information that, that you can um, before you, you sort of um, offer, uh, what if we did it this way? I don't think you should be afraid to offer suggestions for how things work, but it might be even be better to say, um, can you explain to me or can you help me understand why this approach is not something we do today is, is a reason why that doesn't work. Um, you know, the idea that um, that you're seeking information is often creates sort of an opening to a conversation rather than a barrier to a conversation. Um, I was I worked as a software consultant for over 10 years. And a little trick that I learned when I was stepping into a difficult situation, because nobody hires a consultant when things are going well. 
right? Like you're always stepping into a mess. And unfortunately, you were probably hired into the mess by a boss who felt like maybe their other employees caused the mess. And that's not a great situation to walk into. You're, you're immediately walking into a hostile environment. And um, one of the things that I, I generally fell back on is, look, you know, I'm just here to help. How do you think we should fix this problem? And then grab on to whatever you think is appropriate and say, okay, I like your idea. How can I help make that happen? Um, you can sort of, you know, there's this whole psychology of dealing with people and dealing with difficult situations. And you can sort of, you can sort of steer people to a common solution if you, if you convince them that their idea is the right idea. Even if you took something they said and you sort of massage that into a consensus idea, um, giving them all the credit for this is a good idea, I really like this, I want to help. Um, often removes all those roadblocks that people run into when they think there's con con uh, con con conflict, right? I I'm It's you against me instead of us being together. Um, there's a great book, and I know it's cliche to recommend a book, but um, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie has been a staple of business for 90 years now. Um, in fact, when I was a manager, I had 50 direct reports. Whenever I'd send an email, I'd use the Dale Carnegie principles of communication and they were written in the 1930s and I'm using that for email. Um, so, you know, how did, how did a person in the thirties give me advice on how to write email? It's just great advice on how to deal with difficult people or difficult situations and how to achieve common goals. So if you, if you always try to approach a scenario of, I want to help solve a problem, but you try to find an avenue of being an ally rather than an adversary, um, it, it's one of those things that it's, the, it's, it's not, I don't feel like that's great advice, but it's kind of the best advice I have for you is when you're coming at it at a disadvantage, and, and if you believe your age or the fact that you're a student puts you at a disadvantage, when you're coming at things from a disadvantage, you need to try to find common ground. And you can do that by either trying to give away the credit. Um, asking for help is also a way to create common ground because now when you're asking for help and someone's giving, your help, giving you advice, now they are your advocate. They want you to succeed because they feel like, well, their success is dependent upon the fact that I do give them good advice. Um, so asking for advice can make someone an advocate. Um, that's, uh, was that helpful at all? I'm not even sure that that was helpful at all. That was pretty helpful. Okay. Um, you know, you're always gonna, there's always going to be a time in your life when you feel like um, I'm an underdog for this reason or that reason. And trying to find that, um, a way to turn somebody into an ally and to avoid conflict. Um, you never, you're not always going to succeed. Um, but finding ways to do that, th there are some tricks that you can use to, to start conversations off on the right foot and steer them in the direction that you are hoping they can go. A lot of times in my experience, I've been, there's, I'll walk into a situation and I'll, I'll believe I know the right way to solve this problem. The trick is, is I have to convince everyone else that my idea is the best way. And usually what I would do is I would try to, I would ask a lot of questions. I would find that nugget of gold that I'd be like, all right, that's my, that's, that's the way I'm going to lead us to the solution. And I would try to lead that person to my solution. But you know what? A lot of times along the way, we'd find a better path and we'd, we'd, we'd steer away from my solution to something that was even better because we were working together. Um, so it's hard. It's a life skill and you really have to work at it. But that's my, that's the advice I can give. I Any mean, other? I would agree with you. Yeah. About that. Like, I know just like within kind of like my own team, like I was kind of like the underdog cause I became a captain my sophomore year, like right after COVID and like, I was kind of just brought into the position just because like I was one of the few freshmen that were super active, but it was really hard my sophomore year because I didn't, I wasn't exactly all friends. Like I hadn't been friends with the juniors and seniors. Like I didn't have a full year already under my belt. And so just kind of gaining that experience and while it was really hard, like my first soft, like my sophomore year, like this past year has been absolutely amazing because a lot more of my friends, you know, 
um, that are juniors now, like they all kind of have like that shared experience, but I definitely feel for you. Like when you don't really feel like you're the underdog and like, no one's really paying attention to you. And so just kind of listening and like, um, trying to offer some help, but may, like sometimes being quiet and listening and then helping, you know, later on, that's really helpful. I don't know if anyone else, like one of the students has any perspective on that, but that's just kind of what I've seen just like within my own team. And I mean, this is coming from a person who is like incredibly bad at everything Scott just talked about. Uh, 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 but um, yeah, I, I think definitely, I mean, I think of the group of people we have, there's been, there's a lot of people here who had the experience of being a sophomore captain. Um, at least, you know, because I was, I was put into a weird position where, because I was the only coder in my freshman year, I was the code lead by default. Um, uh, but um, there's definitely, you know, I think I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, as students, um, cause I think, you know, everyone who's on the board so far is pretty well known, you know, within our, uh, area of first. Um, and yeah, I think that the people who are leaders, student leaders in first, um, are, you know, I think that, you know, as a whole, I hope that we'll be able to, you know, work with people and just, you know, offer help and see where it goes from there. Before we go, there's one thing that I wrote down here that I want to chat with briefly is that, and that's funding. Um, so I mentioned that I'm the treasurer for Nightcrawler. I manage all the money that comes in. I, I know where it goes. I know where it comes in. I know where it goes. Um, I would, I would caution against, putting too much emphasis on getting government funding. Government funding is can be kind of fickle, can be really hard. It can take years to advocate for. There's a reason why people hire lobby, lobbyists to try to push their initiatives through Congress, and whether that's a state legislature or above. Um, it's not to say you shouldn't try. Um, I've talked to some of the folks that are trying to push the bill through the Minnesota State House right now to get the funding they're looking for, and it's it's not looking very good right now. Um, despite all of the ground legwork they did in the beginning, all the groundwork they laid, um, things are not going the way that they had hoped, and the bill's been sort of massaged and manipulated so that the funds can be used by more than just first, if it even passes. Um, and so it can be really tricky. Um, I will say something similar for the schools. I mean, if you guys can get funding through the schools increased, God bless you. I think it's a great thing. Um, I, I don't think there's a single person in first who doesn't think that the school should, should put more money into first, um, comparable to what they put into the athletic programs or things like that. Uh, again, those things are happened at a very high level budget meeting. It's very hard to advocate at that level and it, it can, if you can do it, if you can get the leg work and get the sport, I think that's fantastic. It's a big rock to push up a, a steep hill, um, in my experience. Now, you guys, some other people on the call may have different experiences, um, but it's it's hard. I think you have a whole lot more success um, obtaining funding. It's not a it's not a you know kind of a line item in a budget every single year. You kind of have to run out there and do the leg work every year a lot of times. But if you call up a business and say, hey, we know that you guys build circuit boards or you make pistons or whatever it is you make, do your research. We love to have our students come in and get a tour. Would you be willing to give a tour to 10 or 15 students? And you follow that up with a letter of, hey, we're a robotics team. X, Y, Z of our funding comes from sponsors um, and businesses like yours. Would you be willing to support our team this year? That's a lot easier if you've already, if as a business owner, you've you've taken the pride of I get to show some kids who are interested in what I do, how we do the things we do. That's really awesome. I have all that pride, and I've looked all of these students in the face, and then they send me a letter asking if I'll be a sponsor, and I have to say no to these kids that I just talked to last week, and I had a great time, and they were interested in my stuff, and now I'm going to say I'm not interested in yours. Um, it's a, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but I can tell you that it's probably been the most successful type of cold relationships that we built with businesses in our area is by doing that type of thing. 
it takes a student and probably an adult dedicated to making those relationships happen to call out to 15 to 20 of those folks in a month and try to, to build those sponsors. The other thing that's all a little bit easier and quite frankly, maybe a lot easier is to figure out um, when your when your students come in and they sign up at the beginning of the year, ask them, where do your parents work? And identify the businesses where you, the parents are employed and then work with the parent, work with the business to say, hey, we see that you work for Cabela's or we see that you work at 3M. Um, would you be willing to help us get in touch with the right people and see if they're interested in sponsoring our team? Um, I will say for Nightcrawler, almost all of our sponsors, not all of them, but almost all of our sponsors have a relationship with a mentor or with a parent of a student on the team. And it's it's sort of low-hanging fruit to try to build those relationships. I think it's important that, especially in this economy, when people are tightening their budgets, we've lost sponsors. Our sponsors that we did retain, many of them lowered their sponsorship contributions. I think it's important to show value to the business too. So the idea that, hey, we'll come in and do a demo. When are you doing your summer picnic? We'd love to bring a robot by and show it off to your employees and their families. Um, if you can do those th- types of things, if you have the capacity to do those types of things, I also think that solidifies that relationship and it makes the call the following year to ask for sponsorship dollars a little bit easier. It's a hard problem to solve. It definitely is. Uh, from a student perspective, um, I know my team has a pretty good, our school pays for like all of our entry fees and they'll help pay for transportation and stuff like that. One of the ways we got that was, like, one of our kids has a parent on the school board, and a couple of our team leads are in the activities office three or four times a week. Like, we make friends with the higher-ups in our school, and that makes them want us to get better funding. It makes them have a personal, like, reason to help us, which... Humans are inherently selfish. They want the things that they want to do well to do well. Um, And for, like, businesses, businesses are so desperate for workers and new skill that, like, we've been going to Chamber of Commerce meetings, and they're, like, eating out of our hand. They're like, oh, my God, it is great that there are students here. Oh, my God, you want to be elected? You want to be engineers? Great. Here's a thousand dollars. Like they just really want students to do well. They want us to be their future workforce. And playing on that has really helped us. Like we've raised seventy thousand dollars this year. Yeah, I, I think those are great strategies. I think they're really, really great strategies. And you know, and I feel like it's a lot easier, as hard as it is it's a lot easier to get money out of the private sector. So from private donors or from businesses, um, I think it's a lot easier to get money out of the private sector than the public sector, trying to get money out of governments. I mean, I, I agree hundred percent with you about schools. If you can get relationships within schools, um, show that your, your existence within schools is important. Um, whether that's just being present, it, whether it's running a ton of volunteer hours to, to support concessions or, whatever it is that your school does. Um, we shoot t-shirts from our robot for pep rallies and for homecoming and all of those things. And we have good visibility in the school, whatever you can do to build that relationship is great. Um, and if you can get that to translate into funding within the school, God, fantastic. Right. But I, I do think that it's a lot easier to pull money out of the private sector in my experience than out of the, the public sector. That doesn't mean you shouldn't try. I, I don't want to discourage you from trying, um, but I, I think it means that you need to try multiple approaches in different places. We're at 8.30. Any other last bits of, I mean, if any of you want to talk to me, have a phone call, do a Zoom call, I am happy to do that anytime you want. Um, giving advice to entrepreneurs is something I used to do on a weekly basis back in the day. Um, I, I'm happy to share business advice or just, just general kind of 
how to communicate with difficult people, whatever it might be, um, anything I can do to help, I'm willing to do that. Question for students. Um, is there a place to find a like written, um, written in words, what um, like sort of uh, leadership, what the student board looks like and what, what the purposes are? All of the things that you shared verbally in this meeting, is there like a written um, element of that? Is there a place that we can find that? Um, I know we created a planning doc before this meeting started. Um, yeah. <laughs> We don't currently have a website or any social media right now since we're still trying to get it up and started. Um, but we want to get like a website and then like social media up and started. Since like everyone's been busy with competitions too, since we had like Worlds and State back to back. So that and we have our AP test. Yeah. Yep. Ian, have you ever done web programming? Um, I took an HTML course in seventh grade, um, but like it's, I mean, I, I mean, I know you're a coder. I don't know who who else is on this call as a coder. Um, if you're going to put up a web page, I would highly recommend it looking at GitHub pages. It's yeah, free. I would use GitHub pages probably. Yeah, yeah. GitHub pages. Um, I will say that GitHub will recommend that you set up Jekyll uh, as the builder environment for that. That's hard to do on a PC. We really struggled, especially with the last Windows update. If you have a Mac, I think it goes a lot easier. Um, but there's other options, like you can use Go, I guess. There's a programming language called Go that you can use to build your static pages. Um, I think we might try to switch to that over the summer. If you need help with GitHub pages, that's what my color uses. I'm happy to help for anybody who wants help building a site. Um, Lexi had mentioned a process for onboarding to the board at the start of the meeting. Do you Can you give sort of a an overview of what that looks like, what that process looks like right now. Are you accepting uh, new folks onto the border? Is that a... That was directed at the students, right? Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I would say right now, we are kind of trying to recruit students from like specific sections. We had it written down on a document, but I think we do want to have like a more, like we do want to have like a specific group of students from like each specific se like Minnesota high school section. But then we still want to have like students involved that, you know, aren't like part of just like the like people we found from like each section. So I think we still we still have a lot that we're working on and like getting all the students involved. We're just trying to get it like started up, get people thinking about it. Um, but like once we start finding that stuff out, like I know you have like Ian's number, right? And like all that stuff. So we can get that sent out to you and then uh, we can get that sent out to like the different hubs and stuff since a lot of, you know, you guys mentors, you guys um, will help us out with that. Um, and we're just really thankful for like everything, like getting on this call tonight and like spending your time just like listening to like and helping us out. Um, and so thank you guys. I think it's been really helpful. <laughs> uh, does anyone have the link for the um, was it Twin Cities Leadership Discord? Um, yeah, I could probably uh, get that to you. Um, I'll leave my Discord in the um, comments so that you could probably reach out to me. or um, And then I could get it later there. Um, just because we have a little bit of a process to get people in, um, but yeah. All right. Does anybody have any thoughts on what we should talk about next week? I'll just make something up and send it out. Where are we? Are we getting to the end? States get done. Nobody wants to talk about robotics on Sundays anymore. I'm always done talking about robots on Sundays. Um, Another thing to keep in mind, though, is that next week is Mother's Day. Just, oh, yeah, um, we can't do it next week. Yeah. yeah. You get to spend time with your moms. Aw, can't do robotics? Got to you know, hang <laughs> <laughs> out with my mom. <laughs> gotta bring your mom to the meeting. And the oh, yeah, we could have to bring your mom yeah, to the meeting. Yeah, and then we can have, like, parents complain the entire meetings about how during robotics season we all disappear for, like, three months. <laughs> 
I think the following week is Memorial Day too. A lot of people might not even be around. I will. I'll be camping, so I won't even be around. I think if it's Memorial Day, dang it, we may we may have a big stretch here without a call. Um, no, the next weekend is the twenty first. That's not Memorial Day yet. But is that Mother's Day? Or, oh, you're talking no. about oh the weekend. No. Next okay. weekend is Memorial Day. The weekend after that is the 21st. That's so we can Memorial do the call on the 21st. All right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, we'll have to. I'll, maybe what I'll do is every what, everybody that signed up for the mailing list, they said, here are the things I'd like to talk about. Maybe I'll dig through that list and see if there's anything in there that is a common thread. And I'll just pick something off that list and we'll send it out. Yeah, and if you could get people to do like meetings about more technical stuff, because I know like this original I started, I was like, you know, a technical thing for sort of drive and I watched because I wasn't at that one, but I watched it when our team was putting together a sort of drive um, after North Star. And, you know, it was, you know, really valuable for us to see, okay, these are all the common problems that people are encountering and keeping those in mind. It saved us, you know, a lot of troubleshooting. We were able to, you know, get it coded and running in one day after it was built. Um, nice. Uh, maybe okay. we should do I, I did I do recall that there were several people that are asking about on shape maybe we should do a little uh, session on on shape and specifically how to like import Andy mark parts and vex parts and things like that and how to do like maybe we should just build a robot chassis at, at, during a meeting and give people the tips and tricks for how to do that non shape I think definitely doing some on shape because I know our team's struggling in the CAD department because we don't have any dedicated CAD mentors and our CAD people are graduating this year. And so I've been like, on, um, and so now I'm teaching myself CAD because, you know, I'm bored and don't want to. Meeting on CAD would be really nice. Cause I taught not. myself. Oh, sorry, Paul, go ahead. No, no, you can finish. I taught myself how to CAD because I wanted to make some things to 3d print for myself. Um, but then I always was like, how in the world would I put in a gearbox? I don't even understand how to do this. And I finally forced myself to go watch some videos on it. I'm like, oh, that's not hard. that's not that hard. That actually is kind of easy. So just getting past that initial hurdle of how would I create a piece of one by two box aluminum and how would I attach it to a sort module? Maybe that's enough to get people to go out and, and explore on their own. Yeah. All right. I think we've decided. Let's do that. Let's plan to do a little intro to CAD on shape um, for folks and we'll make that our next call. Do you also want to include like what you guys use for CAD in that? Like just like a general? Uh, well, I, I think on shape is everything I've heard from people is that a lot of teams have finally trend. Well, they're not finally, a lot of people have started transitioning away from SolidWorks to on shape because it, you can collaborate online immediately where with SolidWorks, you have to put it in grab CAD and someone's got to download it. Onshape also has version control, so you can go back and see what changed. So, I don't know. I feel like Onshape has become the more popular version, and we should do that. All right, that makes sense. I'd have to knock a lot of rust off of my SolidWorks skills. I haven't done SolidWorks in almost two years. So, I think let's do Onshape. Plus, it's all open source, so you guys can pull down all the models from everybody else. If you go out and search for, like, Andy Mark parts... If you, if you like punch in the model number of an Andy Mark part, you might go out and find yourself a whole bunch of other teams' robots <laughs> because they're probably all open source. And you can, you, I have, I have seen that where I was looking for, I was looking for a pixie cam because I wanted to put the pixie cam model on a robot, and I ended up running across three other teams' robots because they had put the pixie cam on their robot too. It was kind of fun. All right, that's the plan. Uh, again. All the, I think, you know, the mentors here, we want to help wherever we can. You certainly can contact me. Um, I'd be happy to help. If you guys approach problems with a positive attitude and a willingness to kind of be part of the solution, I don't know why anybody would, you know, just immediately turn you away. Different people have different reasons for different things, but let me know how I can help. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.